Okay. All right. Recording is on, and welcome everyone to our lecture on BC three zero eight Revelation and Daniel. Thank you for joining the class today. Uh, let's take a moment to pray, and then we will get started. <clears throat> May I ask somebody to uh, please lead us in prayer, and then we will start. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, the class we are about to have. And God, I thank you for being a God who speaks and who reveals things to us, Jesus. And as Pastor Ashes teaches the truth, God, God, I pray that Jesus will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and to be fully convinced in the truth and to prepare ourselves for the greater calling and purpose that you have placed in our life, Jesus. Be with us, Holy Spirit, you teach us. We declare uh, complete strength over Pastor Ashish. We thank you uh, that you are uh, healing him uh, through the process, Jesus. And uh, God, I pray for all my classmates. Bless them all in the name of Jesus. Be with us uh, throughout the session. Give, help us to have a good Wi-Fi connection as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so we had... Um, just started our study on Revelation. Uh, we have, had gone through Revelation chapter 1, and then we had some questions. Uh, so I will start by answering the questions that uh, Jeffin had put in the sorry Google Classroom uh, based on Revelation chapter 1. So we will answer these questions first, and then we will move forward. And if, of course, if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask. So, um, Revelation chapter 1, the question is uh, from verse 4. Um, maybe I'll just um, uh, I'll copy paste uh, what um, uh, Jeffina has uh, shared in the chat so others can see it, the questions. And it's, of course, it's on the Oh, wait a minute, it's being cut. Okay, I can't paste the whole thing. <clears throat> anyway, um, let me just share my screen then. All right, I'm just sharing the, uh, the question that's from uh, the classroom, Google Classroom. Um, so you can see the questions? Everyone can see the questions, yeah? Uh, yes, Pastor, you can see, you but just, it's just small. It's too, oh, it's too small. Okay, okay, let me just increase this then. Um, oh, it's too small. I'll have to increase the size. Yeah. All right, uh, hopefully it looks a little better now, and I can make it a little bigger. All right. It's better. And now it's uh, clear. All right, so these are the questions from the cl Google Classroom, just sharing it. We'll quickly go through it, and then we will continue. So <clears throat> first one is on chapter four. Who are before his throne? Is that literal in heaven? Are they literally... Um, seven thrones for the spirit. So this is chapter four, and he says, um, um, there are seven spirits who are before his throne. So um, what we know is the throne of God. Now that's literal. So God is seated on the throne, uh, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, when people have visions, of heaven, they see heaven, um, they see the Father seated on the throne, they see the, uh, the, the the eternal word or the Son of God seated on the throne at his right hand or standing before the throne and so on. So that aspect is literal because we're seeing it in many places throughout scripture. 
But in verse 4 where it says, the seven spirits who are before his throne, that's where we said that seven spirits, we have to uh, take it as prophetic uh, words, meaning seven meaning perfection, completeness. Spirit, there's only one Holy Spirit. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God before the throne, but he is seven, meaning he's complete, he's perfect. So the throne is literal and the language to describe the perfection of the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits. You know? So that's what we read in verse four. So one Holy Spirit, but he's completely perfect. Next question. It's that was the first question now. Next verse six. Um, it says, and he's made as kings and priests to his God and Father. Meaning, can you give more explanation on this phrase? Kings and priests to his God and Father. So, kings and priests. Now, that's a very interesting phrase. Um, in both the Old and New Testament, there are certain um, phrases or certain pictures that God uses about his people. For example, in the Old Testament, uh, God says, you know, that uh, in the Old Testament, is, we have the understanding of priests, but of course only selected people are priests. In the New Testament, all of God's people are priests. But even under the Old Testament, God told his people, you know, you are a nation of priests. That means they are there to serve, they are there to worship God. Uh, the same thing carries over in the New Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, God often refers to his people as his bride, God being the bridegroom. The same thing we see in the New Testament. God refers to his people as his bride, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. So there, are, there is this parallel pictures in the Old and the New, and these are pictures of words that God is using to describe certain characteristics of his people. So here, he, very specifically, the Lord Jesus is... Um, John is speaking and telling us that the Lord Jesus has made us, verse 6, kings and priests to God his Father. So uh, you'll also see in some places it says a kingdom of priests. So there is this king aspect and there's a priest aspect. A king aspect or a kingdom aspect represents dominion, authority, um, the, the rulership of God being expressed through his people. The priest aspect expresses us here to serve God, worship him, pray, intercede. Right? So as kings and priests, we, we, are, we are involved in two roles or two purposes, to uh, administer his kingdom, uh, to be a part of carrying out the kingdom purposes of God, the um, the rule of God, and as priests, we are here to represent people before God. We are here to serve God through worship and prayer, and just you know, uh, spending time in His presence. So, the, both these aspects are highlighted: kings and priests, kingdom, priesthood. Uh, that's what it means. And we see this in other places in the New Testament, First Peter chapter two. Uh, it says, "We are a royal priesthood, kingship, priesthood." Then, uh, next question, uh, verse 8. Um, uh, it was, uh, so Jesus is saying in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and is and is to come. Uh, so the end, the one who said these words, how are we saying it's Jesus who is speaking? Um, so the terms Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end, and the one who was, who is, who is to come, we see both God the Father and the Lord Jesus you know, using this. Uh, even uh, in the Old Testament, you know, God says, I'm the beginning and the end. You know, or, so the reason we are saying uh, it's the Lord Jesus is because the same thing is repeated uh, in verse 11. And when he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what you see, you write in this book. So. Uh, we're just keeping in mind that the same person is continuing to speak. And in verse 11, he's saying the same thing. Uh, and it is very clear 
that uh, the one who is speaking is the son of man verse 11 12 13 so therefore we uh, we you know we can infer that uh, the person who was speaking in verse 8 is the same person so um, that's how we can say you know it's the lord jesus speaking but the title alpha omega beginning and is used both by god the father and god the son and then uh, there's another question. What is the third heaven? Does that mean there are first and second heaven as well? Okay. So answer is yes. Um, in the New Testament, you find the term third heaven to refer to the place where God dwells. So which obviously implies there's a first heaven and the second heaven. Um, as we understand it, uh, so the word heaven or heavens uh, is used many times in the Bible, but depending on the context, we should understand which heaven is being referred to. So there is a first heaven, which we generally call the atmospheric heaven, that is the uh, the heavens that are surrounding the earth. The We call it the physical heaven or the celestial heaven. You know, uh, uh, and the psalmist would say, you know, when I Look at the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars. What is man that you're mindful of him? So that's the first heaven. It's the atmospheric heaven. It's the, if you want to use the word, the universe in which we dwell. Right? That's the first heaven. There is a second heaven, which is the spiritual side to the heavenlies. Right? So it is the, the first heaven is a physical heaven. The second heaven is a parallel spiritual heaven. It's the realm in which we have, for instance, uh, principalities and powers, demonic powers operating, the second heaven. Right? So sometimes, sometimes we picture it like layered, you know, first layer around the earth is the physical heaven, the atmospheric heaven, then another layer around it is the second heaven. Now, doesn't necessarily have to be like that, and it's not like that, it's just a picture. The second heaven but actually the second heaven actually touches the earth meaning it's the spiritual realm that encompasses the world uh, in which demon powers operate spirits of wickedness darkness operate but angels also operate you know god sends his angels to operate so it's a parallel world that's the second heaven the third heaven is beyond the first and the second heaven so if you want to picture it, we would put it outside, you know, beyond the second heaven. But the third heaven literally is the realm in which God lives. It is very far and it is also very near. So what do you mean? It's very far because it's beyond what we can understand. It's not a place like we can shoot a rock, rocket or a spacecraft to and go and visit or something. It's so far, but it's very near because there is no distance in the realm of the spirit uh, so the lord is here he's in heaven but he's also here heaven is his throne the earth is his footstool so he's like he's never away from the earth so uh, it's far in the sense that uh, you know it's not uh, something we just step into it in and out but it's also very near but that's the third heaven, the realm in which god lives okay so I hope I answered uh, those questions. Uh, any follow-up? Is it clear? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from Revelation chapter 1? Okay. So now we are going to uh, step into Revelation um, uh, um, chapter, uh, let, let me just pick up in the end of uh, chapter 2, uh, sorry, cha end of chapter 1, and then we will move into chapter 2. So in Revelation, end of chapter 1, we uh, see Jesus, and we said, uh, you know, the last class, last the, the week before last, that he is walking among the candlesticks and each of these candlesticks are representing one of the seven churches so 
again candlestick very interesting because it's an Old Testament picture of the tab in the tabernacle and that picture of the Old Testament is being carried over into the New Testament and it is being used to represent the local church very interesting uh, in the Old Testament uh, what we said was in the uh, holy place which is uh, from the outer court you come into the holy place in the holy place there is a candlestick which gives light because there is no other source of light uh, in the holy place it gives light and that is where the priest would he had two things to uh, two things to do he had to change the bread the special bread it's called the show bread he had to change that replace that he had also to um, the altar of incense the the incense that is burnt up he had to keep the fire going and it was a candlestick that gave light in the holy place for the priest to be able to do these two things the word of god uh, which symbolizes for us the word of god and prayer and worship Right. So, revelation being given so that God's word, prayer and worship can happen in the holy place. So, that candlestick is now used as a picture of the church. And it says here <coughs> that uh, in verse 20, it says, uh, that these the, the the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches in revelation 1 verse 20 right? the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches Right, so lampstands, each lampstand representing one of the church in the presence of the Lord. And the seven stars, each star representing the angel of each of those churches. And we also had mentioned the word angel in the Greek simply means messenger. And depending on the context, we would say, is it you know an angel, angel, angelic messenger? Is it a demon? Satan's messenger, or is it a human a messenger, a preacher of the gospel, right, or a human person? So we uh, we said that you know uh, these seven stars had to be had to represent the leader of each of the local churches, whom the Lord Jesus is having in His hand. It means two things. Of course, it means protection. He's protecting the leader of each of the church. But it also means accountability. It means the Lord Jesus. Excuse me. The Lord Jesus is holding the leader of each of the local church accountable. He's holding them accountable, holding them in his hand. So it's a very serious thing, you know. Many a times we say. I want to be a pastor, I want to lead the local church, very nice. Uh, of course it's a calling, but we must understand the seriousness of it. He is holding us in His hand. He's protecting us, thank God, but He's holding us accountable. And He is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Right? And uh, he's walking, verse 13, he's in the midst of the seven lampstands. He's in the midst of his local church. He's like examining, he's seeing what's happening. Right? So with that picture, uh, we see, Jesus, of course, we see Jesus having described himself as the resurrected one, the one who has conquered uh, death and hell, verse 18. He has the keys of hates and death. That means he has authority, he's conquered it. And he has complete authority, he has complete dominion over Hades and death. And this Lord is now speaking to each of these seven churches. 
Now, the question we have to ask is today, of course, he, was, he spoke to only seven churches. At that time, when Revelation was being given to John, there were many hundreds of churches all across that region. Right? So it's not that there were only seven churches. There were hundreds of churches planted. The apostles had gone, the disciples had gone you know, all across Asia Minor. They had even started traveling to other places, planted many churches. So obviously there were hundreds of churches. But here we have a record of the Lord's message to the seven churches. It is very interesting, as we will get into chapter seven, uh, chapter two and three, that to each of the seven churches, it begins by saying that it begins by the Lord Jesus addressing the church, but it ends by saying. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. It's very interesting. So for each of the seven churches, you see this pattern. The Lord begins to speak and he, he, um, he introduces himself in a very specific way to each church. And each message ends by saying, this is what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Interesting, because the Holy Spirit is the one who takes what Jesus is saying and speaks to us. And Jesus mentioned that in John chapter 16, right? Verses 13, 14, 15, he said, I will send the Spirit of truth when he's come, he will lead you into all truth. He will show you things to come. He will take what I am saying and he will speak it to you. So, today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to each of us what the Lord is saying. Now, we understand it as true for every believer. But in this context, as leader of a local church, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you what the Lord Jesus is saying about the church, <clears throat> about the local church. Where are you? What is happening? What is good? What is not good? Where do you need to repent? Where do you need to make correction? Um, you know, the assessment of the Lord concerning that local church. Today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to the leader of that church. Every every church, every church. So the other interesting thing is the plur plural, he says, let him who has ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to the leader of every church and to every, and to ev the congregation through the leader, speak to every church. But each one has to listen. Right? So sometimes we fail to listen, we fail to go before God and say, Lord, what are you actually, what are you saying? You know, where are we as a church? Are we walking right before you? Are you are we doing the things you want us to do? Oh God, where, where do you want to correct us? Uh, where do you want to, you know, where are we missing things, you know? So if we go and ask the Holy Spirit, He's going to speak, He's going to tell us. And I just want to, you know, present that to us, those of us who maybe are in leadership today, or maybe you will be in leadership, uh, you know, someday, soon. Uh, when God gives you responsibility in your church, uh, in your congregation, or over a community of people, however, however God gives you, the the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and me. What the Lord is saying to each of us, to each community, and we have to listen. Right. So, 
let's read portion by portion from Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And this is very, 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 very interesting, very powerful uh, uh, to look at what he has to say to each church and uh, for us to take some lessons from it and begin to apply it in our own lives, in our own ministries. So let's, somebody could read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, please. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things. These things say, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and have and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicola Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Mm. Amen. So there's a lot here that we can look at. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. The first of the seven churches. The Lord is addressing the church in Ephesus to the angel. So we said angel, messenger, human person in this context, because um, spiritual angels are not pastoring the church or leading the church. It's a human person who's leading the church. Uh, so to the messenger of the church, that is the uh, spiritual leader there, give a message. So the Lord is speaking to the leaders. People who are in authority, who are responsibility. Uh, so this is what I want to say to you. And uh, to the church in Ephesus, the Lord identifies himself like this, as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and as the one who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So, in other words, he's saying, Ephesus, church, uh, the leader, I want you to know this, I'm the one, I've got every every leader in my hands, so which we explained it earlier. You know, it's a symbol of protection, but it's also a symbol of accountability. And I'm also walking in the midst of the star labs. That means I am observing. I am paying attention to everything that's happening in the local church. It's not like you know, I'm just uh, letting all these churches go on there. No, no. This is the one who's speaking. The Lord is the one who's holding every leader accountable. And he's observing what's happening in every local church. So that's the one who's speaking. Revelation 2, verse 1. So what does the Lord have to say in the church of Ephesus? Now, keep in mind, what is this church in Ephesus? It was founded, or let's say it was established by the Apostle Paul. Who was the one who established the church in Ephesus? Paul. In Acts 19, in his third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul had come to Ephesus. Uh, he spent three years, maybe even a little more than three years in Ephesus. Uh, there were great signs and wonders, and uh, many people turned to the Lord. And uh, while Paul was at Ephesians, uh, during those three years, he trained many young people. Uh, their names are listed in uh, Acts chapter 20, the first four verses. You read uh, at least about 12 different young men, maybe more, whom he trained while he was in Ephesians, and these people would have gone and planted more churches in Asia. So we're talking about a church, a local church, that could say the Apostle Paul 
was the one who started this con community. So, so it's not a, you know, I mean, I'm speaking in human terms. Uh, it's not a, you know, oh, some, we don't know how the church started. No, the great apostle Paul was the one who came, who preached here, who established this church. And then we also know that, uh, you know, after Paul was in prison in Rome, uh, around AD 64 or AD 66, when he was released, he came, the Apostle Paul came, and he appointed Timothy to be the leader of the church in Ephesus. So the church in Ephesus could also say, not only did the Apostle Paul uh, was the person who started the church, but, excuse me, but Timothy, somebody trained by the Apostle Paul, somebody whom Paul said is my beloved son, he was our next pastor, our next bishop. So this was not an ordinary church. This was a wonderful, you know, they had wonderful leadership. So from AD around 66 approximately, we don't know the date for sure, but estimated, from AD 66 to now it is AD 96, 30 years later. Right? Timothy has been, uh, Timothy has been, uh, was the next pastor. Now we don't know in AD 96 who exactly was the leader of the church in Ephesus, whether it was Timothy or somebody else, the transition would have happened and somebody else may be in leadership, we don't know for sure. The name is not given, but what I wanted to point out is, as a local church, Ephesus has had a history of true, two wonderful leaders. Maybe now they have transitioned, they're in a third generation of leadership at this point. Uh, but, you know, it's not an ordinary congregation. So that's the church the Lord is speaking to. And what's he telling them? He says, verse 2, I know your works, I know what you're doing, your ministry. I know your labor, that means you're working very hard. Uh, I know your endurance, that means you're, you, you have a lot of perseverance, patience, endurance. You're, you're tough, you, you don't give up easily. And uh, you're also very discerned, uh, you know, you are also a church that holds on to the truth. So you cannot bear those who are evil. So it's a very righteous church. It's a very diligent church, very fervent church, very righteous church. A very discerning. You've tested those who say they're apostles. You found them liars. You know, if, if anything is needed in today's church, the modern day church, it is this, the discernment. Sometimes the discernment is so lacking in our modern day church, you know, and so I feel so bad <laughs> when I see some of the things happening. But uh, this Ephesian church was very discerning. So somebody could say, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, whatever, but these people are very discerning. It says, you tested those who say they're apostles and you found them liars. Meaning you just don't, you're not very gullible, you don't just believe anything, you don't fall for anything. You are, this is a very discerning church. Right, so they are, they're, they're very fervent, they're very diligent in their work, they're very enduring, very strong, they hold on to righteousness, they are very discerning. And verse three, uh, they're untiring, you know, they persevere, they labor without tiring. So, if you look at the Ephesian church today, verses two and, uh, two and three, you know, by our understanding, this is a very good church. Very good church, local church. Very healthy, because they are serving, they are righteous, they are discerning, they are persevering, 
They are untiring. A very, very good church. Very good local church. I mean, it has like people probably give hundred on hundred. This is a very good church. But the Lord is looking for something. And he finds something lacking. And that's the touching part. That such a good church, such a good church. You know, we would recommend, oh, this is the best church in the city, maybe. I don't know. Oh, this is oh wonderful church. But God, the Lord, is finding something lacking. What is it? And it's not a small thing. It's a very serious thing. That's verse 4. It says, nevertheless. That means, you know, all these things are good things. But there is something against you. There's something. You have left your first love. You have left your first love. So, only God can see that. Only the Lord can see it. Because when we people look at the church, they say, wow, this church really loves Jesus. I mean, look at all that they're doing. Yeah, they're working hard. They are fervent for His name. They are holding on to the truth. They are discerning. Uh, they are enduring. They are untiring. Oh, they really love Jesus. But something is wrong. It's only the Lord can see. What is it? It's not that they don't have the love for the Lord. But so notice, he didn't say, you have left, or you have stopped loving, but you've left your first love. That means, you've departed from that place of keeping him first. So if you ask the leader of the church, or you ask the congregation, do you love Jesus? Yes, we love Jesus. So it's not that they have stopped loving the Lord. They still love the Lord. True. But what has happened? The love for the Lord comes down the line. Maybe, I don't know, third or fourth or fifth or something like that. You have left your first love. That means, my love for God, for the Lord, is not first. It's not that I don't have love for God. You, you know, the church has love for God. They still love the Lord, just that they don't love Him first. Maybe second, maybe third, maybe fifth, I don't know. The, um, the inference we can make is, that maybe all these good things that, that they were doing, the works, the ministry, the holding on to the truth and discerning of false apostles and um, the untiring uh, uh, work for God, maybe those things became more important and then, number five, number six, I love the Lord. Do you still love the Lord? Yes, yes, we love the Lord. But He's not the first love. And that is what the Lord found. So it has something against you. There's a problem. Now, is this a serious problem? It's a very serious problem in the eyes of the Lord. How serious it is, is it? Because he says, verse 5, Remember 
from where you have fallen. That means, when I leave my first love, there is no chance for me to go up. When I leave my first love for God, the only trajectory is down. Remember, from where you have fallen, means you, you've gone down. You were here, you're a very good church, you're doing all the busy, busy things, but gone down. So spiritually, we are actually on a downward trajectory. But like I said earlier, you know, when people come and see the church, that's a very good church. Look at all that's happening. Look at all the, you know, all the all these good things. Very good church. But spiritually, the church is actually going down. So the Lord, it's a very serious thing. That's why the Lord is alerting them. Remember, from where you have fallen, what is the solution? He says, verse 5, Repent and do the first works. The word repent literally means to have a change in my thinking. Uh, many times we, we hear the definition of the word repent as, you know, to make a hundred and 180 or 360 degree turn. You know, you're going one way, you go the other, you start going the other way. True, that's repentance. But what causes that kind of a change? Did it start changing? Did it change your thinking? That means I have to pause and say, hey, the Lord has to be my first love. All these things are good. Uh, all these ministry is good, but the Lord has to be my first love. So that has to change. That is repentance, right? I have to change my thinking. I have to accept that and say, yeah, that, that is true, and that's the way I want to live, by keeping the Lord as my first love. Repent. And do the first works. So, it's not enough to say it in my mind and say, yeah, Lord, you are number one in my life. The way the Lord is going to see that He is number one in my life is when I do the first works. What are the first works? It's the works that express my first love. Right? That means, is the things that I do towards the Lord, and what I would do as the Lord being the, my first love. Which really, if you put it in simple terms, it means you seek God first. You love Him first. You worship Him. You spend time with Him. You spend time in His Word. These are simple things. But these are the first works. right? Expressing our first love. Because this church was good, it was doing everything else. It, you know, it was, uh, it was not tolerating evil. It was very discerning. Oh, very good church, but the first works. And this was so serious because he says in verse five, if you don't make a change, if you don't make a change, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. That's verse 5. Very serious. He said, if you don't do the first works, I'll remove your lampstand from its place. You have to think about that. What does it mean? For the Lord to remove the lampstand from His presence. 
So the church is going on on the earth. The church on the earth is represented by a lampstand in the presence of the Lord. And he's speaking to the church in Ephesus, which is on the earth, saying, you need to repent, you need to do your first works. And if you don't, if you don't change, I'll remove your lampstand from its place. I mean, the lamp, there's going to be no, this church on earth is going to have no representation, no connection to the very presence of the Lord, who is the head of the church. Which means the activity of the church can go on here on earth, right? It will keep running, of course. It will keep running on the earth. But its lampstand is not before the presence of the Lord. It has no representation and has no connection whatsoever in the presence of the Lord. That is very serious. It's very serious. Okay. Uh, I know our time is almost up. We haven't finished this, so we will we will review this again next week. I see there's a question in the chat. John says, so the local church can serve people at different spiritual levels. How should we understand this as a general word of correction? Even now, for example, we intentionally keep time, a prayer, worship more God's word even during the week to focus on spending more time with God, to love God more, not everyone tends. So how do we uh, address this? Not everyone is interested to. Yeah, I think um, one is uh, at a personal level. Right, at, at a personal level, uh, so so remember that uh, this first works is 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 not it's not something we not only the corporate but also the personal. So we encourage people maintain your first love. That means your first thing to do, even before you come and be involved in ministry in church and all of that is to do your first works, which is, hey, you take time to seek God, you take time to pray, you take time to keep God as the first love in your life. So basically, every individual, we encourage them, you know, keep God as the first love in your life. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. So, that's the first thing. Personally, that everyone, from the leader on to everyone in the congregation, put the Lord God first in your life. And then we invite the church to focus on that through simple things. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, practically, uh, things will be varying because of, you know, from place to place, city to city, but uh, whatever's practical to get people focused, keep the focus of the people on the Lord, on His Word, on loving Him, worshipping Him. And then what we do coming out from that place of keeping Him as our first love, right? So even if you're meeting once a week, that's fine, it's, it's okay. But as long as in that gathering, our focus is on Him, loving Him first, yeah? So, uh, we will pick up on this more next week. Uh, we haven't finished, but th these are good questions. These are good questions, practical questions we have to ask. How do we apply uh, what the Lord spoke in Ephesians to the church in Ephesians, how do we apply that in our, in our lives? Uh, we will continue this discussion next week. Okay? All right. So, um, I would request somebody to please close in prayer. I'm sorry, I'm doing only one class today. I will I will be fully better next year, next week. And we will pick up speed and we will cover Revelation, okay? So, uh, could somebody lead us in prayer, and we will dismiss. Sure. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that we had. And uh, 
God help us to get back to our first love, to always love you first, to always hold on to, to into the place of love. We stand in all of you, Jesus. And God, uh, I pray that Jesus, even we, as we are equipping ourselves to be the ministers of God, will keep uh, all these things in our mind. And uh, as we are in your hands, God will be accountable in everything that we do, Jesus. And God, once again, I declare complete uh, healing and strength over Pastor Ashish. And uh, we thank you for everything that you're doing in his life. And uh, we thank you for the class that we have. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll connect again next week. Have a good rest of the day. See you soon. God bless you. Bye.